Good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all to SPEC CERTA Prep's webinar, Identifying and Quantifying the Uncertainty Associated with Classical Method Titration. My name is Amy Williams, and I'm the Marketing Manager for SPEC CERTA Prep, and I'll be moderating the presentation today. This is part two of a series on uncertainty. Last year, we presented a webinar on the calculation of uncertainty by an instrumental method such as ICP. And this webinar is already available on our YouTube channel. Since then, we've had many requests for a presentation to include other methods, and we are pleased to present that to you today. Before we begin, I'd like to get a few housekeeping items out of the way. Everyone in attendance today will receive an email with the presentation slides and links to the webinar recording on our YouTube channel. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them in the question box on your screen and we'll answer as many of them as possible during our Q&A session. If we don't answer your question, we will contact you after the webinar with an answer. Now I am glad to introduce Vanija Sibukumar. Vanija received her PhD from the Department of Inorganic and Physical Chemistry from the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore, India. She worked with Lieber Brothers India as a research chemist for nine years before coming to SPEC CERTA Prep 20 years ago as the QA and Regulatory Manager. She served as SPEC CERTA Prep's Vice President of Inorganic Manufacturing and is now a Quality Management System Auditor with Underwriters Laboratory. Vanija? Thank you, Amy. Good morning, everyone. As Amy mentioned in her introduction, this is the extension of the series on uncertainty. In the first lecture, we talked about calculation of uncertainty from instrument method. There we explained various statistical parameters that would be used in calculating uncertainty. I would like to start with the same concept for this presentation as well since there could be some viewers watching this for the first time. In the past, chemists focused on precision of results from any given method. However, these days it's not just enough to have a precise method. We have to establish the quality or accuracy of results by stating a measure of confidence. One useful measure for this is measurement uncertainty. Since precision, accuracy, confidence limits or interval, errors in measurements are fundamental to analytical chemistry, we will be covering them here only briefly. Main goal or thrust of this presentation is to explain about uncertainty in practical terms. We'll be showing one of the ways to calculate uncertainty, taking example from standardization of sulfuric acid with sodium carbonate. We will calculate uncertainty associated with the measurements as applied to the process we have chosen. True value for the quantity measured depends on method, instrument or measuring device, nature of measurements, and skill of the operator. Any of these could introduce measures, errors in measurement. You can be confident about the results from validated method and a well-maintained instrument. A well-trained operator applying his or her mind to the task at hand and through experience can gauge the quality of the results. In spite of all this, an experienced chemist, precise instrument and a validated method, it is hard to get the true value of measurements accurately. There are always errors and uncertainty associated with the measurements. So what are these errors? Typically, there are three types of errors. Determinate errors, indeterminate errors, spurious errors. Determinate errors can be avoided if they are recognized. Unpredictable variations in repeated observations of the measured value is one example. Errors associated with this are consistently bigger or smaller. This can be reduced by increasing the number of observations. Indeterminate errors or random errors, on the other hand, exist by the very nature of measurement data. The analyst does not know their magnitude, nor can he control it. 
These indeterminate errors affect the precision and accuracy of all chemical work. One such example is error due to inadequate control of experimental conditions. This can give rise to systematic errors that are not constant. These errors can't be eliminated totally. However, we should attempt to contain them in an as narrow a zone as possible. Other possible errors are spurious errors. These are due to human or instrument failures. Whatever be the type of errors, we have to eliminate or minimize them. One way to minimize the determinate errors is to make a series of measurements on the same object and report the average. What is an average? When we do an experiment, we take a number of times measurements and calculate the average value from all these replications. It is the sum of all the individual measurements divided by the number of measurements. As you all know, average represents a central tendency wherein lies the true value. It's not an absolute value. It's only an estimate of true value. So how can you estimate the true value? One way to do, though it's approximate, is through standard deviation represented sigma or s. And you express true value with average and standard deviation. So what is standard deviation? This is represented by this formula where x is the measurement data from that individual measurement, x bar is the average of the total measurement that you took, and n is the number of replicates. Standard deviation shows how much variation or dispersion exists from the average or expected value. I said earlier an average gives you estimate of true value. This is called point average. By using standard deviation, you can pinpoint the range within which this true value lies at a certain confidence interval. The terms confidence interval, confidence level, confidence limits, and interval estimates are used interchangeably. So you express the true value as average plus or minus 1.645 at 90% confidence interval or x bar plus or minus 1.96 at 95% confidence interval, or x bar plus or minus 3.091 at 99.8% confidence interval. So you are expressing the true value by the dispersion of the standard deviation. Now that represents your accuracy. Accuracy is the correctness of measurement in relation to true value. Let us examine these charts. Say you want to do a titration and your end point of the titration corresponds to 8.5 mil to give an accurate equivalent point. You perform 8 replicates. The red line here represents the true value. The green or the blue indicates the values obtained by measurements. In the first graph, you see the average of 8.55, which is close to the true value of 8.5. However, there is a dispersion around the true value. This is a good accuracy, but precision is not so good. In the second graph, you get an average of 7.39. The measurement results are far below the true value there is a consistent error giving a bias towards the low value. Hence, this is not accurate. So you go to the precision, which is reproducibility of the method. The third graph shows you, the you got the intended value of 8.5, which is close to the 8.55, and the replicate showed a closeness to true value. This is good accuracy and good precision. The fourth graph you got here, you got the true value almost close to the true value 8.55 by way of averaging the number of measurements. However, the values are all scattered all over the place. 
you can't have confidence in this measurement. So this scatter is represented by variance, standard deviation, or average deviation. Average deviation is a measure of dispersion or scatter around the true value and is given by this formula. Smaller the average deviation, the more precise is the measurement. However, it's not an accurate measure of precision. Variance and standard deviations are better tools for indicating the spread of measurements around the true value. Derivation of all these equations are given in any standard book on statistics. So the, all the parameters like standard deviation or multiples of standard deviations such as 2s or 3s or width of the confidence interval show the dispersion of results around the true value. This dispersion is the uncertainty around the true value or the measured value. Uncertainty is a parameter associated with the results of measurement. This characterizes the dispersion of values that could reasonably attributed to the measured value. In general, the word uncertainty relates to general concept of doubt. The doubt is certainly not about the validity of the measurement. In fact, knowledge of uncertainty increases the confidence in the validity of a measurement result. At this point, it's important to distinguish between error and uncertainty. Error is a single value and cannot be known exactly, whereas we can estimate the uncertainty. Uncertainty estimation is simple in principle. Uh, we can follow your five-step approach to calculate uncertainty. As a first step, we should have a clear idea of what is to be measured. We should review all the errors that could be corrected or elim and eliminate them. Write down all the processes. Do you dilute the reference material? What is the sample dilution? What are the devices used? What are all the environmental conditions? Is there any uncertainty associated with the equipment? Gather all these information. Now identify and quantify uncertainty from each component in this process. Information given the step four will consist of number of quantified contributions to overall uncertainty, whether associated with the individual sources or with the combined effects of several sources. The contribution expressed as standard deviation should be combined according to appropriate rules to give combined standard uncertainty. Then it should be expanded by applying a coverage factor. We will go in details for each of these steps. For quantifying uncertainty as a first step, you should know what type of uncertainty it is. Is it a type A or type B? Type A is associated with repeated measurements, usually like replicates in titration, or averaging many readings in instrument. Type A uncertainty is expressed by this formula here. Type B, on the other hand, is based on scientific judgment using all the relevant information available including previous measurement data, manufacturer specification, or data provided in the calibration report. There are three common models for type B. They are rectangular, triangular, and normal. Each one has a different normalizing factor. To calculate the standard uncertainty from the listed uncertainty, we apply this normalizing factor. We will review these factors for each model. Rectangular distribution is used when uncertainty is stated without specifying level of confidence. When there is no confidence interval stated, there is no reason to expect extreme values. Normalization factor is 1 divided by square root of 3. So to convert to a standard uncertainty, you would divide the listed uncertainty that you know and by the square root of 3. 
The second model is triangular. Here, the distribution is symmetric and measured value lies close to the target value. We use this distribution when we take into account uncertainty associated with volumetric glassware. For example, you have a Class A volumetric flask of capacity 500 milliliter. Listed tolerance from the manufacturer for this is plus or minus 0.2 mil. The normalizing factor would be listed uncertainty divided by square root of 6. So this is what you would use to convert the tolerance to your standard uncertainty. This model is based on normal distribution. This is used when we make an estimate from repeated observations of randomly varying process and express the results in, with certain confidence interval. Example, um, you know, if you have a certificate sometimes that arrives, you have the uncertainty stated with the stated level of confidence. They might give you a coverage factor that is K, that is usually the term used for coverage factor is K. So they may say this coverage factor is 2, 2.08. If not, it's not given. If they just state it is at 95%, you might want to use 2S or 3S. So far, we reviewed the types and models to be used for uncertainty associated with each task. Now, we combine all of them based on the following principle. To combine uncertainty from each component for a particular source, we use model number one. For example, if you have a pipette, you use the uncertainty from the volume from the manufacturer as well as the temperature. So you would be combining the components of uncertainty for pipette by this model. These interim uncertainties could be combined to give an overall total uncertainty and this is the model that we use. Here we use what you call a relative standard uncertainty. It is observed in chemical measurements dominant contributions to the overall uncertainty vary in proportion to the level of analytes. So it's sensible to use relative standard uncertainty when we combine from each source. Although the combined uncertainties used to express the uncertainty of many measurement results, it is required to define an interval about the measurement results. The measure of uncertainty in that intended to meet this requirement is termed the expanded uncertainty. And this is done by the coverage factor K. So expanded uncertainty equals K U C. Coverage factor depend on confidence interval and number of observations. For most purposes, it is recommended that K is set to 2 for observations of greater than 7. For lesser observations, you could use two-tailed value from student's T. Once you expand the, the combined uncertainty, you would express your true value as average plus or minus combined expanded uncertainty. So these are the terms we will be using to express uncertainty for the results from the measurements that we are going to show you now. Average, standard deviation, combined uncertainty, and expand, ex, expanded uncertainty. So far we have covered the theory behind the uncertainty calculation. So let us use a practical example. For instance, a titration process and see how we can proceed to quantify uncertainty associated with this. So we will base this on the determination of normality of sulfuric acid with sodium carbonate. So let us review the steps. What are the steps would we follow? We would follow the five-step approach 
that I discussed earlier. So what? In this case, we want to determine the strength or the normality of the sulfuric acid we prepared. What is the process? It's a simple acid-based titration. A known concentration of acid is titrated against the known concentration of alkali to arrive at an equivalent endpoint. What are the sources of uncertainty? The uncertainty associated with the preparation of the standard, uncertainty associated with the titration, repeatability and so on will be the sources of uncertainty. We will be going in detail in the next few slides. Once identified, we will calculate uncertainty for each of these processes. Finally, we will combine them from each of these steps based on the principle we stated earlier. Normality of the sulfuric acid that we want to determine is you arrive at this by this equation. N2 equals V1 N1 divided by V2. By plugging in the values that we got in our experiment, we arrived at the value plus or minus 0.02499N. Here the value for V1 is the volume of sodium carbonate. N1 is a normality of sodium carbonate. V2 is the volume of sulfuric acid that we got and N2 is the normality of sulfuric acid. Now this value that we have finally as an average also is associated with the uncertainty from all these processes. So what is the process? What is the symbol that we are going to use to represent the process? For the volume of sodium carbonate that you use, we want to use the symbol UV1. For the uncertainty associated with the preparation and the determination of normality of sodium carbonate, we want to use the symbol UN1. For the sulfuric acid volume, we want to use the symbol UV2. The normality that we arrived at by way of average is a combination or uh, addition of all these uncertainties and that we represent by U and 2. So we, I would like to present here a fishbone diagram or a cause and effect diagram. The aim here is to identify all major uncertainty sources and to understand the effect on the analyte and its uncertainty. As I mentioned earlier, we have four components here, UN1 coming from sodium carbonate, UV1 coming from sodium carbonate, UV2 coming from sulfuric acid, and U repeatability from the overall process. The combination of all this is leading to the uncertainty of the normality that we determined. So what are the components for the UN1? You take certain amount of sodium carbonate, you make it up to volume, so there is a weight component uncertainly associated with it. There is a volume component here. The volume itself has two components, tolerance and temperature. Then the molar mass of sodium carbonate, that would give you some uncertainty. And the certificate that we used, the compound that came with the certificate has some impurities. So that impurity from the certificate. So UN1 is a combination of all these interim uncertainties. UV1 is the, we use a pipette to deliver the volume. So that has two components. One is the temperature coefficient of volume of expansion for glass and the tolerance associated with the pipette. So UV1 is the combination of these two interim uncertainties. Now you V2 sulfuric acid is again very similar to U, UV1, only we used a burette here instead of the pipette. So again it has a component from tolerance of the burette and the temperature coefficient. Then overall we repeated this process many times to arrive at the average. So that gives you yeah, uncertainty 
and we would add all these together to arrive at this. So let us examine how to calculate UN1. We use NIST SRM 351A for preparing cylinder solution. We weighed, we dried the material for the number of hours that is stated in the certificate and we weighed exactly 1.0386 gram in a balance and then we diluted it to one liter volumetric flask. There are three uncertainties associated with this process. What are they? Weighing on the balance, making up to volume in a volumetric flask and the impurities that we got in the, from the certificate, the SRM certification. So let us consider the first one, weighing on the balance. The uncertainty for the balance calibration was the listed uncertainty divided by the normalizing factor for rectangular distribution. We used rectangular distribution here because the balance certification that we had did not have the stated confidence interval. If you have the balance calibration certificate with the stated level of confidence or a coverage factor, you could use the triangular distribution. So we have, the, we have arrived at the um, standard uncertainty for the balance. But the standard uncertainty, the weighing process itself has two processes. It is done in two stages. We take the empty boat and the boat with the compound. Hence, uncertainty from the balance is a combination of these two processes. So you calculate the standard uncertainty combining these two. Once you have the standard uncertainty, you divide it by the value that is this. This is the amount that we weighed. So this table here gives you in a nutshell all these formulas and values. So what is it? The device was balanced. The value is 1.30386 grams that we weighed. The standard uncertainty that we got, which is similar to this, which is this, there is no other component to be added to this. So the combined uncertainty is same as the standard uncertainty. This will become clear to you when I talk about the uncertainty from a pipette. So currently for the balance, we have the combined uncertainty same as the standard uncertainty. Then we have the relative uncertainty given here. And this column here shows you the square of relative uncertainty. The reason I'm giving this to you here is later on I'm going to combine all the relative uncertainty by taking the sum of squares of this and making a square root of that. So in order to facilitate plugging in of this value into my final equation, I'm showing in my table all the time the square of the relative uncertainty. Now the second component for the UN1 is making up to volume in a 1000 ml volumetric flask. There are two uncertainties associated with this preparation. There is a tolerance associated with the flask which was given by the manufacturer as 0.3. As I mentioned earlier, this follows a triangular distribution. So you divide this by square root of 6 and arrive at this value. There is a temperature coefficient of expansion for glass for the pipette. That is usually given by this formula. This varies 2.1 10 to the power of minus 4 per degree Celsius per ml. And our, the variation in our lab was 3 degree and the total volume is 1000 milliliter. So you plug in all this value into this equation, you would get this value. So the combined uncertainty for the flask is a combination of U tolerance or U volume plus U temperature. So these are taken from the earlier slides and you arrive at this value. Now you have to calculate the relative uncertainty. So to do the relative uncertainty, the value is 1000 milliliter. That's what we used here. And this table once again puts in a nutshell all these values. The value is 1000 mil. 
the tolerance and the uncertainty from the tolerance is given here the temperature is given here and you combine these two is given here and the relative uncertainty is this divided by the value which is given here so the third component is the SRM certification as I told you we use the SRM 351A the certificate stated a 99.97 purity plus or minus 0 0.014 as the uncertainty with a coverage factor 2.08 so you divide the expanded uncertainty by the coverage factor to arrive at the standard uncertainty now you calculate the relative uncertainty here so this is again the table that shows you the value certified value from the SRM 99.97 expanded uncertainty from the certificate value is 0 0.01 coverage factor was 2.08 standard uncertainty calculated from this is given here and the relative uncertainty is a standard uncertainty divided by the value and that's given here this is the from the SRM certification still component of UN1 the fourth component is the molar mass the listed uncertainty is taken from the IUPAC table for sodium, carbon and oxygen. The atomic mass represent, and the uncertainty represented in the IUPAC table is for sodium atomic weight is this, coded uncertainty is this. IUPAC table did not state any confidence interval so we use a rectangular distribution uh, and then the normalizing factor associated with it so that is a value here for carbon the atomic weight is taken from the IUPAC table and coded uncertainty is also given there so we normalize it and convert it to standard uncertainty for oxygen as well the coded uncertainty was divided by square root of 3 to arrive at this value now this is the atomic mass now sodium carbonate is consists of two sodium atoms this is Na2CO3 so two sodium atoms so the weight calculation is two times the atomic weight and standard uncertainty also is two times the standard uncertainty that we calculated now carbon is one atom so we just replicated this here oxygen is three atoms hence the weight component mass component from oxygen is three times the atomic weight and the standard uncertainty is three times this so you have you sum this up and your uncertainty is square root of sum of all this so for the mass of sodium carbonate which is the sum of this we have this uncertainty given here now this table again presents in nutshell the whole thing the mass is given from here and combined uncertainty is here and relative uncertainty is the standard uncertainty or the combined uncertainty divided by the mass which is given here now we saw we had four components of interim uncertainty for this particular process of U and 1 coming from balance coming from volumetric flask coming from SRM certification coming from molar mass and these are all the uncertainties for each of this process and so the total uncertainty is square root of sum of squares of this so we arrive at the total value of uncertainty for sodium UN1 for sodium carbonate now let us proceed to calculate the second component UV1 UV1 for sulfuric acid what we did we took 50 ml of sodium carbonate to analyze sulfuric acid so there is one uncertainty associated with this represented by this symbol UV1 which is the pipette pipette again I have explained this process earlier for U and 1 so the listed uncertainty from the manufacturer normalization factor is used triangular distribution so listed uncertainty divided by the square root of 6 give you the uncertainty for U tolerance 
Now it has a temperature coefficient um, component, which again we plugged in the 50 ml that we used on the same equation that we used before. So we arrived at 0 0.0182 as our value. Now we have to combine both the uncertainty, that is U tolerance and U temperature for the pipette. So when you combine this, you arrive at this value here. Sorry. So the relative uncertainty here is a combined uncertainty divided by the value, which is 50 ml. And uh, U tolerance, this is a combined uncertainty is a combination of U tolerance, U temperature, and relative uncertainty is combined uncertainty divided by the value which is given here. So now we have to proceed to calculate the uncertainty of the third component, UV2. To analyze sulfuric acid, what we did, we took the sulfuric acid in a burette and we titrated from the burette to a sodium carbonate volume that I said earlier. So there is one uncertainty associated with this symbol UV2 that is coming from the burette. So again, the principle is very similar to your calculation of the pipette uncertainty. You have a listed uncertainty for the burette from the manufacturer and it follows a triangular distribution. So your U tolerance is listed uncertainty by the square root of 6 and you have the temperature component which again the standard equation that you follow and plug in the value and this is 39.2 was the, our titrant value. So you plug in that here for the volume and you arrive at this value here which is 0 0.014258. Now for the burette component we have to combine the interim uncertainties of tolerance and temperature as we did for the pipette. So we arrive at this value. Now we have to calculate the relative uncertainty for this process. And again the value here is 39.21. The U volume and U temperature which makes up the combined uncertainty for this particular process is given here. So the relative uncertainty is combined uncertainty divided by the value and which is expressed here. So there is one more component for here that we have to consider. When we did this normalization of sulfuric acid, we did a number of replicates. We took about seven replicates and then we calculated the average from each of these replicates. We arrived at this value. Now the standard deviation for this particular process also we calculated based on our equation for standard deviation which is given here. So the uncertainty due to repeatability, this is because of the repeatable titration, we follow the type A. So you remember the type A where we use the standard deviation and the normalization factor as the number of seven replicates that we used. So we plug in this, the standard deviation is plugged in from the earlier equation that we had and the number of replicates that we have. So we calculate the uncertainty here. The relative uncertainty is the standard uncertainty divided by the value. The value was the normality, the X bar that we arrived at from the earlier slide. So you divide that and you get the value U relative uncertainty in this here. Now, we completed quantifying uncertainty from each of the process. So what were the process? UN1, uncertainty from sodium carbonate. UV1, uncertainty from the volume delivered from sodium carbonate. UV2, uncertainty of sulfuric acid volume. Repeatability of the measurement itself. So the total is, uh, the, the uncertainty that you should calculate is a sum of, square root of sum of this and that is expressed here. And the normality that we found by our average was this. So this Normality is multiplied by the uncertainty that we got here to arrive at the uncertainty associated with U and Q and which is 2.92 to the power minus 5.
Now, only one task remains, which is to expand this uncertainty. I use the standard coverage factor 2 at 95% CI and multiply the uncertainty that we arrived at earlier and I expanded it here. So the normality of sulfuric acid that we got here is 0 0.02499 plus or minus 0 0.00006N. Expressed in terms of um, a percentage is plus or minus 0 0.23%. Now, we have various components for the interim uncertainty. We want to know which contributed significantly to our uncertainty. So what we did, here we charted the relative uncertainty from each task, such as the flask, valence, SRM certificate, sodium carbonate, sulfuric acid, and repeatability, and molar mass. We charted this. As you can see, the significant contribution is from the repeatability volumetric, sulfur, volume of sulfuric acid and volume of sodium carbonate that we delivered and as well as the flask. Valence and certificate did not have much influence but you can see the molar mass did not contribute much at all. It is not at all significant. So this is the case in many of the calculations I have done. If you want, you could omit the including of molar mass, the uncertainty from the molar mass from your calculation, but you may have to justify why you removed it. So that's the reason I'm giving you this. More calculation of molar mass is slightly tedious. If you want, you can remove it, but you may want to justify this as well. So in summary, using the process approach, and breaking it into five steps I had discussed above, you can calculate uncertainty quite easily. It's not so difficult as it seems in the beginning. This presentation indicates general methods for estimating uncertainty in analysis. It's by no means comprehensive. It depends on conditions and nature of analysis. We use the information given in these references to arrive at our calculation. This presentation we focused on titration. We are planning a series of presentation focusing on methods, preparations, etc. and we will be making them available to our customers. If you want any particular process to be done, you please contact our marketing and sales and they would include that in our future presentation. Thank you very much for listening to this presentation and I welcome any questions now. Thank you very much uh, Vanija. Uh, uh, we do have some time for some questions uh, and I encourage you to um, ask any questions you may have by entering them on the question box in your screen. Um, but uh, Vanija will ask a few answer a few questions now. Uh, the first question is what would be your approach on qualitative methodology such as the ones found in microbiology? So the question was, what would be your approach on quantitative, a qualitative? qualitative methodology such as the one found in microbiology? Uncertainty calculations are dependent dependent on practice used by the lab. Based on your practice, you can probably estimate whether they are type A, type B. And if they are type B, you can also figure out where it fits in the distribution norm. So if you define all this and use the five-point approach, the same approach as I had discussed in my presentation, you can arrive at the calculation. If you have a particular process in mind, you may want to discuss this further with our marketing and sales. Okay. Uh, another question uh, we have is, how did you know? How did you know to use type B uncertainty for uncertainty for the flask, balance, and pipette? And how do you know when to use the rectangular versus normal versus triangular distributions? The question is, 
how did you know to use type B uncertainty for the flask, balance, and pipette? How do I know when to use rectangular versus normal versus triangular distributions? Did I get this correct, maybe? Yes, that's correct. Type B uncertainty for class A volumetrics would follow triangular distribution. Class A products are calibrated by the manufacturer by measuring the calibrated volume quite a number of times. Hence, the values are likely to lie closer to the target value. You would think the distribution is greatest at the target value and falls off slowly at the, towards the end of the range. So it would follow a triangular distribution. That is why you divide it by the square root of 6 resulting in a smaller standard deviation as compared to other distributions such as rectangular where you divide it by square root of 3. Usually the class A pipette, uh, the manufacturer uses a very tight tolerance and to do that he gives a number of measurements. Uh, the next question was um, how to use, how to know rectangular versus normal versus triangular. Um, you would use a rectangular distribution when you have limits stated for a value without specifying the level of confidence. You have no idea wherein, where the range of the uncertainty lies. So for instance, um, the true value has an equal probability of being anywhere in the range. Hence, dividing by the square root of 3 will give you a larger standard uncertainty to counter the effect of lack of information. So you would use a normal distribution. Uh, the next question is, do I have to consider the uncertainty or the purity of the water used in preparation of sodium carbonate solution. Let me repeat it. Do I have to consider the uncertainty of the purity of water used in preparation of sodium carbonate solution? Um, in a laboratory, usually we use reagent grade water. Uh, in, in laboratories of our type where we make reference material, we use um, double distilled water, double deionized water. So here, when you use the reagent water, you would expect there won't be any, anything that is affecting the purity of sodium carbonate. So usually, you know, it, it contains about 50 ppt of carbon dioxide. So, parts per trillion, yes. Okay, and how about, what is the appropriate number of replicates needed when using the standard distribution curve at 95% confidence level? Is it a minimum of n equals 7 as you stated or more like n equals 20 is ideal? The question is, what's the appropriate number of replicates needed when using the standard distribution curve at 95% confidence level? Is it a minimum of number 7? or number 20. There are many experiments done. What is the ideal number of replicates that you have to use? There is many times there is no value added when you add, when you do a replicates more than seven. If you have an established method and you have done that so many times in the laboratory, even three gives you a very good idea uh, and gives a better average. So I took seven because it was easy to calculate the coverage factor by using students' table. Now, if you have a well-established method and you have done it a number of times and your standard deviation is not very dispersed, I would think that you, know, you could use anything below seven and use the student T for your calculation of coverage factor. Another question we have from the audience if this normality of sulfuric acid is used in a subsequent titration of an acid, how would you combine the uncertainties of the normality of sulfuric acid and determination of the acid concentrate, concentration to achieve an overall uncertainty associated with the acid determination? 
Good question. The question is asked, you use this sulfuric acid that you standardized for subsequent titrations and what would you do? Now, your sulfuric acid that you had prepared and standardized and quantified the uncertainty becomes almost your reference material. So you have an uncertainty associated with this, you have calculated it. Now use this for your subsequent process. The other process that you have may involve further dilution of something, preparation of your uh, sample that you want to titrate. Consider all those and as I have stated in my case, the SRM purity that I used, the uncertainty from the SRM purity that I used, substitute the um, uncertainty that you arrived for your sulfuric acid in that place as a placeholder. Okay. How can you include the uncertainty associated with different anal analysts in the calculation of overall uncertainty? or are analyst effects omitted from uncertainty determinations? Again, um, the, this is kind of a repeatability. You know it varies from operator to operator. It varies quite a lot. Yeah, one operator doing seven replicates is totally different from seven operators doing the same seven replicates. So you would find the contribution from the repeatability quite enormous. So you have to take into consideration as the repeatability uncertainty from each operator and then combine them to get the overall uncertainty for this particular process. Is there any perfect standard distribution or uncertainty? Again, um, perfect standard. Each process, the uncertainty a overall uncertainty depends on the process and depends on so many things. So you, if you want, many times we have seen if you use a very tightly controlled process, the uncertainty is low. And again, can I say uncertainty as low as 0.1% or 0.01% is better than uncertainty 0.08%? I can't say that because it varies on the nature of the experiment. What for the same experiment, if you conduct under tightly controlled conditions and you arrive at a better uncertainty, that's the value you should use. But there is no figure that can give you that this is the standard uncertainty or you should maintain within that. As I told you earlier in the presentation, uncertainty is not, if you have more uncertainty, it doesn't mean that you, are, you have a problem. It gives you only um, a confidence in your measurement. It doesn't give you any doubt. Um, this is what I said in the beginning of my uh, presentation. Okay. Uh, when making our estimations of uncertainty, is it okay to approximate or assume some uncertainties are low and therefore negligible in our estimation of overall uncertainty? Yes. Um, in, the, in the last slide that I presented to you, I had... Um, put a chart showing the contribution from the various tasks and then I have shown you the contribution from the molar mass was very insignificant compared to all of the other uncertainties. So if you want you can omit that in your future calculations, I said that. But what happens is sometimes your regulating body may say, did you consider it? So you may want to have this done once or twice and then show your, your regulator or auditor or whoever, okay, I have done this, it is not giving me significant contribution, so I'm going to omit it in my future calculations. And to my view, that is a valid argument. Okay, I think we're going to uh, have one more question. In your example, why did you use triangular distribution to estimate uncertainty for volume measurements but a uniform distribution to estimate the uncertainty for mass measurements? Um, the question was, why did I use triangular distribution for volume measurements and uniform distribution for mass measurements? The triangular distribution, I used a class A pipette. Class A pipette comes with very well specified tolerance. 
So I know that uncertainty component from that is quite low. So if I use the if the, if I use the square root of six as my uncertainty normalizing factor, I will arrive at a very low uncertainty due to the class wave. However, in the mass I have said in the IUPAC table that I use the atomic weights and the uncertainty associated with the atomic weights. IUPAC the table did not tell me what confidence interval that was done at. So I had no choice but to use a rectangular distribution which gives a greater uncertainty value to account for the lack of information about the confidence limit. I think that's about all we have time for today. Thank you very much for the questions. Those were some really good questions. Uh, and I'm glad Mon and Jenny were able to answer them all for us today. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for attending. Uh, and just a quick reminder that we'll be sending everyone a copy of the presentation. Uh, and we'll also be sending an email with a link to a recording of the webinar. Um, and we very much appreciate your time. And we uh, look forward to uh, seeing you back at future webinars. Thank you. Have a good day.